Today's webinar is going to be on how you can monitor the health of all of your models. We'll give you an introduction to how uh, models decay. We'll give some information around how you can detect those things. And we'll also show a brand new product called Domino Model Monitor. There'll be two speakers on today's webinar, Samit and I. Samit, you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Bob. Hi, everyone, this is Samit here. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, in these difficult times uh, and taking time out. Uh, I am the product manager for Domino Model Monitor, uh, and we announced the general availability of this product last month. So I'm very excited to show you what we have and hopefully work with some of you to help you adopt it in your production workflows. Thank you. Okay, and then my name is Bob Laurent. I'm the head of product marketing here at Domino. So in terms of today's agenda, um, I am going to start off with just a very brief level setting around machine learning. So I think it's gonna be important as we talk about model monitoring. So we set a, a, just a certain level set on how models are trained and why they decay. Then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about how to detect model problems before they can impact your business. Then, I'll give a brief overview of Domino Model Monitor and Samit's going to give a live demo of the product. And then we'll save some time at the end for some Q&A. So at the bottom of your um, screen, there's a Q&A panel. Go ahead and submit your questions in there. We'll take them at the very end. If you've got some logistical questions about the webinar itself, we've got Domino employees who are monitoring that channel and they'll get back to you immediately with some information. Okay, a little bit about who Domino is before I get started. We've been around for about seven years. We created the data science platform category with our first plot product that we launched in 2014. If you think about who Domino is, we're a data science system of record for the enterprise. So if you think about salespeople living and breathing inside of Salesforce and marketing people inside of their marketing automation system. It's about time that data scientists had a system of record where they can do all of their work and data science leaders can manage their teams. And that's exactly what Domino does. Uh, we're fortunate to be deployed by 20% of the Fortune 100, including some of the largest banks in the world, health insurance companies, pharma companies, all around the globe. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the concepts that I mentioned at the beginning. So at the most basic level, data from the past is used to predict the future. And that's the fundamental concept behind machine learning and how models are built. So you'll take historical data that will have a variety of different variables, data scientists call those features. And then you've got outcomes or results and data scientists call those targets. Those are historical information about something that uh, you're using to predict the future and then the actual outcome. They'll take that data, they'll feed it into a variety of different machine learning algorithms to create predictive models. Now, it's obviously not quite that simple. There's feature engineering that goes on, there's tweaking of hyperparameters, but the point is they're going to create a lot of predictive models that then they can look back at the historical data and say, okay, is this model a good predictor of actual outcomes that happen, okay? Once they figure out what predictive model works the best, they put it into production. They hook it up to live data coming in that looks like the historical data. So if, as information comes in, it goes through the predictive model and it makes a prediction, okay? So in terms of real life examples, you might be a peer-to-peer -peer lender who's used historical information around people who have defaulted on the loan. You feed information about their income, their you know, the reason for their loan, uh, maybe their job history, where they live, a variety of different things into the model. It created a model. And then that same information is hooked up to a web form. So when somebody wants to apply for a loan, they can go ahead, put the information in, it'll run through the predictive model. And the model might say, hey, this person has an 82% likelihood of repaying this loan. We should you know, maybe loan them some money. 
You might have Salesforce information that's feeding information about past customers so that you can take that same information, look across your prospects and say, out of all the customers and prospects that are out there, these are the ones I should proactively reach out to. Maybe these are the ones who should get an email. These are the ones who should get a direct mail piece, et cetera. You might have information coming out of your inventory system or your point of sale system that was used to create a predictive model. So then you take that same information over time, every day or maybe every week or something like that to figure out how often we have to order more shirts you know, in, in Excel for green, you know, for example, and do that across all of your SKUs. And then you might also have IoT devices that are hooked up to uh, machinery that's on your manufacturing floor. And you'd be constantly looking at information like on, you know, maybe rotation, temperature, things like that, feed that into a model and then use the model to figure out, is the machine about to break? Are there some things that we need to do from a uh, predictive maintenance uh, standpoint to maintain that machine before it actually does break? Okay, but I, the core thing to remember is models are built using historical information and time goes on, life happens, things change. And the models that you put into place using historical information may not be reflective of today's times. You might have financial markets that shift. Um, things, you, people go into a, a recession, right? Incomes, now disposable income isn't what it used to be. B2B companies that had plenty of money for capital and operating expenses now all of a sudden are you know, squeezed to the bone. They're not buying your products anymore. You want to be able to know those things and decide, you know, is it something that uh, you know, I can continue to use the current model that I have or should I retrain or rebuild a model? Consumer taste change. So these things can happen, gosh, every day, every week, every month. Um, being able to stay on top of even small changes can make big differences in the types of things that you do. So like, for example, I said, we should, how many green XL shirts? Maybe someday somebody wakes up and says, you know what, now red shirts are all the rage. And then we should dial down the number of green shirts and order more red shirts, right? Being able to stay on top of changing consumer tastes is extremely important. I mentioned earlier about IoT devices being hooked up to manufacturing equipment to figure out when they're about to fail. Well, the devices themselves can fail. So you might see an IoT device that's off by, you know, if you're monitoring temperature, 1%, 2%, 5%, then it gets to 10%. I mean, ultimately it may fail. So being able to detect when those devices are degrading and obviously ultimately failing is something that you need to stay on top of, especially if you're using that machinery for you know, critical manufacturing tasks. And then data pipelines can break and also change. So think about a situation, we see this all the time in marketing, where Salesforce is hooked up to your marketing automation system, and then you're drawing data out of the marketing automation system to feed a model. Well, what happens if the pipeline between Salesforce and your marketing automation system, you know, your HubSpot, Marketo, et cetera, breaks, okay? Now, all of a sudden, information that you were counting on about the industry or maybe past purchases or, you know, other critical information coming from Salesforce now flows through your marketing automation system into the model as a null value or a zero, okay? So if you're using that information to predict something in the future, that's a problem. Um, you also might see data pipelines change. So I saw this recently at a customer where they had their system coded to look at temperature and temperature was a critical input to a model. Well, one of the developers decided, you know, it's probably about time to change our temperature readings from Fahrenheit over to Celsius. And they went through a whole big conversion process to convert all their data from Fahrenheit to Celsius. But what they didn't realize was that downstream, there was a model that was looking at those values and temperature and making some decisions. 
So in this case, they see a number come across of 30 and they're thinking, all right, 30 degrees Fahrenheit, let's order some snow shovels. But in reality, that was 30 degrees centigrade and they should have been ordering sunscreen. So very important to keep track of any sort of changing data pipelines. And as I said earlier, these things are constantly changing. I mean, life around us is happening and, and this is no more uh, apparent than in today's world where models built using data from 2018 and 2019 and gosh, even January, February of this year may not be good indicators of what decisions you should be making here in July of 2020. Um, but it's not always that clear cut. As I mentioned, models and, and data changes every day. So how do you detect this, these small, tiny little changes before they have a material impact on some of the models that your business really relies on? And that's gonna be the, the topic of our next discussion around model deployment and production challenges. So as I mentioned, predictive models have a set of historical inputs that were used to create the model, and then a series of new live inputs that feed the model. So one of the ways to detect if models are decaying is to compare historical inputs to new inputs and look at some of the values that are being fed into your model. I'll talk a little bit about input drift in just a second. You can also do something similar on the output of the model. And you can compare the predictions that were fed in, that were used to train the model with some of the new predictions that the model is making to see if you know, average values are changing or some of the, uh, the frequency of, of different predictions are changing in a big way. Again, I'll talk about that in a second. And then the other thing you can do is when actual results are known, you can match those up with the predictions that were made for that particular person or company or SKU or what have you, and compare what actually happened to what you predicted would happen. And that's called using ground truth to uh, make a assessment on the overall model quality. And again, I'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, so input drift. This, as I said, is where you compare historical values to new values that are coming into the model. And you know, if you think about a model, a model is not you know, two or three or four inputs. Some models have hundreds of different inputs. So being able to stay on top of hundreds of different inputs and compare them to hundreds of new inputs is a very difficult job. It's very time consuming. If, if a person were to do that, it would be a full-time job, even if it was just one model, let alone hundreds of models that are inside of a organization. So what you'll want to do is, you wanna be able to stay on top of these inputs that are coming in. It could be things like a particular sensor that's important is now no longer logging any data. You're seeing a certain range of temperature values coming in and all of a sudden it goes to zero, okay? Um, it could be things like people applying for a loan and all of a sudden starting new business is now gone through the roof, right? Maybe the you know, financial markets have collapsed or whatever and now everybody's starting their own business, right? You might, when you see that happen, that might be something that says, hey, the world around me is changing. Maybe I need to take a deeper look at this. Um, you might be in a doctor's office and you, when every time you go into a doctor, you know, you get on a scale, they weigh you, they record your information. Well, you know, maybe if patient weight, average patient weight increases by 15%, yeah, that maybe it's not that big of a deal. But if you're doing a study on obesity or, you know, onset of diabetes, seeing things like that coming through your clinic now might be a really big deal. And they want to be able to set up triggers to say, hey, if this, these kind of things start to happen, I want to know about it. That's a good indication that the world around us has changed. Similarly, on the output side, you want to compare the outputs of a model to historical data, you know, the, the targets that were in the data that was used to train the model. So for example, you know, if you're predicting temperature and you're now seeing 
the average predicted temperature drop by 15%, maybe that's an indication that something's happened in the world, something's happened with those sensors, who knows what. Uh, if all of a sudden their model is predicting that applicants are going to default on their loans at twice what they used to be, okay, that might again be another indication that we need to look at the model. Um, if the number of green XL shirts is, is pretty standard across a period of time, and all of a sudden it spikes for one week, either St. Patrick's Day is coming up in the next few weeks or something has happened. Maybe uh, consumer tastes have changed. Now we need more green shirts, less red shirts. Who knows? But those are the types of things that we need to keep, you know, are, are ways that we can monitor the data that's flowing in and out of a model to detect subtle changes that the world around us has changed. And then finally, ground truth. This is probably the best indication of the accuracy of a model when you can actually compare what happened in real life to what you predicted would happen. It's like, so you think about, for example, um, somebody who wants to take out a loan, right? You say, this is a person who has an 82% likelihood of repaying their loan, and then we loan them the money, they repay their loan, and we can compare it back and we say, all right, well, you know, we were right. That was, we predicted that they would, they actually repaid the loan, true positive, okay? Um, if you look at the confusion matrix for a classification type of a problem like that, you obviously want to maximize the things in green. So the things that you predicted would happen that actually happened, happen a lot. Same thing with things that you said wouldn't happen that actually didn't happen. That's a true negative, you wanna maximize those and then minimize the things in red. So think it's going to happen, but it actually didn't. We think it didn't, wouldn't happen, but actually did. You wanna keep those low. So being able to feed ground truth back into your system to be able to compare these things is a great indication of how well your model is performing. Um, the downside, obviously, is some things you're gonna know right away. You know, if you predict you're gonna sell a certain number of shirts in a particular week, a week goes by and you only sell, you know, 140 of the 200 you predicted, that you know in a week. But if you are predicting whether somebody's gonna default on a 30 year mortgage, it may take you 30 years before ground truth information is known. So you have to keep that in mind, you know, business problem at hand, you know, in, in mind when you uh, want to set up that ground truth uh, loop. Okay. Um, let me hand this off to Samit. He's going to talk a little bit about how organizations monitor models today. Hey, thanks, Bob. Yeah. Um, so now these are some of the ways in which you can monitor models, right? But what are the practical challenges that you face and what's the, and how do organizations today deal with it? Right. Uh, now for any big enterprise, uh, typically you would have multiple data science team and Fortunately or unfortunately, each data science team uses its own flavor in which they put models in production. And, and what I mean by that is some teams may prefer Python based models, some teams may prefer R or SAS or, or other models, right? Even the way they develop their models uh, may be different. Some may be using a sophisticated platform like Domino to do it. Some may be just doing it on their laptop using the open source Jupyter, right? And even when, when it comes to how models are hosted, some may be using, again, Domino platform for hosting. Some may be deploying the models on bare, on EC2 instances on AWS or any of the other cloud providers. What this means is, uh, it is, you need a system which can help you monitor models irrespective of what approach a team has taken to put uh, models in production. Right? And this is a big challenge because uh, you may be able to write a script or write a solution for one uh, flavor, but you need to actually address all of these uh, flavors. The second is, IT teams do actually have monitoring solutions, but they are mostly targeted towards what we call as ops-based monitoring, looking at uptime, latency, and those kinds of issues. Uh, they can help 
you understand whether, um, let's say if your model is deployed as an API, whether it is the services up or not, but they don't really help you understand if the data patterns have changed or if the predictions or the accuracy, et cetera, has changed. For that, you need something which specifically focuses on those aspects. And the third is, so how do uh, organizations deal with it today? One common method is some organizations or some teams say that they are going to train model, uh, retrain model, in fact, every month, every week, or every three months, whatever the period may be, right? Uh, that is okay, but there are some sort of uh, catches, caveats over there. First of all, you don't really know whether after that retraining, whether the issue was resolved or not. Second, if there is an abrupt change, uh, then again, you will only find out at the end of whatever frequency you had chosen to uh, retrain them. Right? And third is if you are retraining too frequently uh, and if generating the training data is costly, it involves human experts, then again, that uh, effort or that cost may be wasted without solving the problem. So you need, what you need is a data-driven approach. The ways some teams approach that is, they actually ask their data scientists to do, to what I would literally call as babysit models in production. Uh, they have data scientists go and look at data patterns either once every two or three months, or when something goes terribly wrong and they, they get complaints from the business side saying that the model is not doing a great job making predictions. Right. So this ad hoc approach, uh, first of all, doesn't scale uh, because you cannot do that for when you have like hundreds of model. Uh, second of all, uh, it, each team or you, in fact, even each data scientist uses their own kinds of test. You has to go and fetch data from different databases, etc. It is highly inefficient and more importantly, it's highly unreliable also. There are a lot of, uh, we have seen cases where people have attempted that, but due to inevitable errors, uh, either in code or other things, uh, their balls have been dropped. And third is, Data scientist time today is scarce and expensive. So the time you actually spent doing this ad hoc activity is the time you have not spent building newer models or looking at newer architectures, right? Uh, there are also quite a few organizations who still haven't, don't monitor their models and uh, works well initially, but you can guess how that ends uh, when things start to go wrong, right? Oh, can you go to the next screen? Yeah, and it is not, so, so many times I hear from different users and different customers that our world is very stable. It's uh, our data patterns tend to be stationary when, when they look at inputs from outside world. However, many times, like Bob also highlighted earlier, issues can happen because of internal factors. It can be some developer checked in a code five or six stages upstream in a data pipeline, which changed the, let's say, the encoding of some of the categorical variables. They didn't realize that one of the models, some few dozens of steps down, gets impacted because of that change. And we have actually seen that happen with one of a big insurance company that we work with. Right? Uh, they actually ended up paying out claims for significant amount of time without realizing that things, the model predictions have been suboptimal or, and it has been because of changes in the data pattern. Hmm? Uh, Bob, yeah. Okay. You wanna come back? Yes, so let me talk a little bit about our brand new product that we introduced about a month ago to solve these problems. It's called Domino Model Monitor. It is the one health dashboard that we've established to monitor all of your models. So like Samit said, it doesn't matter whether it was built with, you know, a variety of different types of technology. Uh, it could be deployed on any sort of deployment platform. So it could be Domino, it could be on SageMaker, it could be deployed on-prem, it could be deployed in the cloud, variety of different places. It really doesn't matter, okay? Wherever the model is deployed, you can bring it into Domino Model Monitor and be able to run consistent checks across all these models. It's basically establish a consistent approach 
to monitoring across your organization in terms of the statistical checks that you run, the frequency that you run those checks. Um, as uh, Samit said, some organizations put models into production and never monitor them, which is you know, a shame. This is a way that you'll be able to establish best practices across your organization. You'll set up continuous monitoring for multiple metrics, and you'll see this in just a second when Samit does his demo, to be able to track data drift for both features that are going into the model and then also the outputs from the model and compare historical data to actual data. You'll also be able to feed back ground truth labels into Domino Model Monitor and compare the prediction that was made to the actual value that resulted through ground truth. And then when you want to drill into any sort of you know, feature on the input side, the output side, et cetera, you can run a variety of different tests in an interactive way and determine is this model, um, you know, is it okay? Does it need to be retrained using uh, more recent information or does it need to be completely rebuilt? And you'll be able to see that by uh, working with some of the capabilities that we've built into the product. And what's more, you'll be able to set up automatic alerts so that data scientists who would normally have to watch over all the dozens or hundreds of models that are put into production, they can go about their day job and they can do uh, value added projects to build new models and things like that. Sleeping well at night knowing that DMM can send them an, informa or a, an alert when one of the models that are in production has failed one of the health checks. Maybe the, the input uh, data has drifted, the output data has drifted, or something has happened with ground truth. You'll set up these alert notifications, or you can hook them into any model hosting system that you currently use using the APIs we've built into DMM to interface directly with that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Samit, who's going to give a demo of Domino Model Monitor. Thank you. Uh, I'll share my screen. Well, let me know if you can see my screen. I can see it. All right. Uh, so like uh, Bob mentioned, uh, your teams would have different flavors. Your teams would have multiple models in production. And only way to deal with it is to have a standardized process of monitoring models, right? Uh, so DMM, Domino Model Monitor, allows you to do that. Uh, and I'll show you how you can actually use it. So I have already logged into the tool. And uh, when you log in, the first thing that you see is the model registry or the model health dashboard. Whenever you register a model with DMM, it will show up in this list. And you can look at a variety of information about the model over here, right? Uh, all the models that you have uh, registered with DMM, uh, you can go and check what kind of models they are, what version it is running, uh, when was it registered, uh, and you can look at multiple versions of the same models also. In addition to doing that, and this is an important problem because uh, it is not just the data scientist who is the stakeholder in this problem. There is also the ML ops teams which are stakeholders and in many cases even the compliance and risk teams which are stakeholders. So having a consistent uh, dashboard where everyone can access the same information and have the same uh, be on the same page about health of their models becomes very important. We hear a lot of time ML uh, ops managers complain that because different teams follow different processes, uh, it is even difficult to know how many models in their organizations are currently in production, let alone whom to contact if something goes wrong with it. Right? So being able to register all the models in one place irrespective of how they were built becomes very important to provide that visibility. In addition to just providing visibility into the model, this also helps you track the health of a model and not just the current or the latest health, but how that health has evolved over a period of time, right? So uh, Domino Model Monitor, for example, helps you track uh, data drift. 
uh, which model has seen a significant data drift and and failing its checks and which model is not right in addition to data drift you can also track model quality uh, and know its status whether accuracy recall rmsc or any of the other performance metrics are within the threshold uh, that you set and i'll show you how you can do that uh, in the tool right uh, in case for any of the check if there is no data available it will tell you that uh, there is uh, no data for that particular check so that you know what happened and if some checks doesn't run for any technical reason again it will show you an indicator saying that x check at this particular time did not run xyz so that you can actually go back and check this is important all of this in information because you want to be able to trust your monitoring solution that it is doing its job right in addition to the health status you can also look uh, it will also give you a quick idea of the traffic that your model has been seeing in the recent past and this becomes important because if on a particular day uh, you are expecting more traffic but you are seeing a drop that may that itself may be a cause of alarm and the other may be if a check has failed for a particular day but the traffic for that day was significantly low then you may want to ignore it and focus on other uh, high traffic days or weeks right so how do you get how do you register a model i already have registered a few models i'll i'll dive into one of them uh, to show you how to do analysis but let me very quickly show you how you can actually register the model so that that's out of the way uh, now it's a simple process Uh, you have to provide some metadata about the model i am just going to call it marketing model for simplicity you need to provide the model version what kind of model is it is it classification regression etc and some information right so i am just going to say predicts response to the campaign right uh, now as part of registration you need to provide a pointer to the training data set uh now with dmm i had already linked uh, some of the s3 buckets as data sources over here uh, so i can choose where that data is located now your data whenever you want to monitor you can be pushing your data to that s3 bucket or to any of the other source so i'm going to use s3 for this demo i'm going to say this is my training data and i am i'm using uh a model which helps predict whether a customer will reply or will respond to a marketing campaign uh, this is an outreach over a telemarketing campaign and it uses both personal attributes as well as the macro attributes to make that prediction uh so dmm will look at what the features of the models are uh, it will uh, infer which of them are features which what kind of features they are numerical categorical etc you can indicate you, which is the prediction over there and if there is a time stamp column in your data you can indicate that also and it will try and identify pretty much all other columns it will create a model uh, metadata information which is used for registering the model this is essentially the features and their descriptions as well as some metadata about the model now there are a bunch of other properties you can also declare i am going to skip through them for the interest of time right so now you see this model has been registered over there so now let's dive into it right so it will first take you to the historical checks to say uh, to show uh, what has happened in the past but since we have only just registered the model there is no history here yet so let's do uh, let's start monitoring the model what the model is now it has looked at the training data set it has looked at the metadata now you can start ingesting the prediction data into it uh, i already have that prediction data in that s3 bucket so i am going to use that again uh i'm going to select which is the prediction file where the data is and just say register now while i'm doing that over the ui in a typical scenario you would actually be doing all these activities through apis uh in a production setting you don't you won't be coming to the ui to add prediction data every time you would have that data in your data source and make api calls every day every hour every week whatever the time period may be now uh, for the features in that model uh, it has already calculated the histograms for the training data set 
And this it has done it for both input features as well as output predictions. And similarly for the prediction data which we ingested, again it has gone ahead and constructed those histograms, etc. So let me, uh, I, I just registered this model. I had made the larger model which I had registered a few days back. So it has a lot more data. So let's look at that to get a representative uh, idea. I'm going to dive into this. So here, now for this model, for the same model with all the features included, uh, it has did that calculations for all of the features. It has applied a statistical test on top of that. Uh, and based on the conditions which you can set, it is says whether the model has drifted or not. Now there are multiple tests that you can use uh, by and you can set which test to use as default, but most of the popular tests uh, you can choose. Uh, you can also select uh, different tests for different features based on whether they are categorical features, numerical features, or the pattern that they have. For, for those tests, it would do the drift calculation, not just for a particular time period, but also for each time, the time stamp within that time period. So it would not only tell you uh, overall how much a feature has drifted, but it has, it will also tell you how the feature has drifted over time and few other information. So let's look at this couple of features which are in red. Most of the other features uh, are in green, right? So here it says that uh, this has drifted beyond the threshold. Obviously you can change it uh, as well as change the condition of the threshold also. Uh, let's look at what has happened. Uh, it shows that it has been hovering around the threshold mark over this whole week that I have selected. Let's look at a longer time period and see. Hmm. So, so what seems to have happened is that the data for this particular feature has started drifting for at the start of this month. Uh, and uh, it has stayed beyond the threshold or hovered around the threshold throughout this month. And it was doing fine through the week, through the earlier time period. So let's go back and instead of just looking at data for one week, look for a longer time period. Right? And, and all of this is important because looking at data at one time period doesn't tell you enough on whether you should be taking action or what is going wrong. You need to be able to drill down into uh, different time periods and do a longitudinal analysis of your data to say, when did things started going wrong, uh, how much wrong and what changed. So if I look at uh, this particular feature, uh, over a, a longer time period, uh, it is actually doing fine. Uh, it only started going wrong at the uh, change of the month. You can also go and check what caused it to change. Uh, and what you can see over here is uh, the histogram of the training data as well as prediction data. And you can see when the model was trained, it was roughly 50% of the data was for people contracted through a landline and 50% through cellular. However, when the prediction data started coming in, that had changed significant, uh, quite a bit. Uh, where only about 25 odd was landline and 75 odd was through cellular. And this is important to know because knowing that a feature has drifted is not enough. You ought to be able to know what in particular of that feature has caused it to change. Uh, so that when you retrain the model, you can pick data samples which represent that particular change and not the whole set because creating a golden uh, labeled training data set can be expensive. The other way in which this helps is if you have, if you are let's say sourcing data from a third party and they have added new categories or classes, let's say you are sourcing data from LinkedIn, uh, new job titles, new education qualifications get added all the time. Uh, if those new classes start showing up in your data, in your features, uh, you, or you will also find out uh, that there is this new data coming in, which will start showing up in the untrained classes. This gives you a signal that when to train the data and how to train that uh, your model on that new data. Right? Now this you can do for the input features as well as for output predictions. Right? Uh, and, and there was a question in Q&A saying that um, can the output 
features change if the input features have not changed or even vice versa if the input features have changed can there be a case where output have not changed well that can happen if you if the change is such that uh, it it you had sufficient samples for a particular feature uh, and in the prediction data that ratio came down uh, and the feature was important then you may not see a change in the output uh, when typically it happens the other way around that the sample for a particular feature or a class within it was small but in prediction data that uh, increased significantly then you can actually see a change in output but not always right uh, so in addition so along with the input features you can use this to track changes over your output predictions also and this is very important when particularly when you have multi class predictions happening where looking at changes in that distribution can help you understand uh, where your models are predicting and how that pattern is changing right so that was about uh, data drift uh, now bob uh, all so before i go to model quality uh, once you have set up your uh, drift tests and test conditions and threshold you can also set up schedules on when to check right uh, so you can say that hey i want to run these tests every day every week every month uh, whatever the time period may be at a particular set time and you can say use new data since the last check or in case you want to use rolling uh, or sliding windows for checks you can do that also and say that even though i'm checking for this daily use last 3 days or 7 days data etc it will run these checks and whenever the checks run you can always come back to the history page and see how those uh, how the model has performed in terms of data drift you can go to each of those checks and see what has changed uh, what which features failed for that particular check and which did not and by how much right so so that was that way you can always be on track of how your input features are changing how your output predictions are changing uh, now as i mentioned earlier bob also said one of the best ways of again monitoring your model is by looking at the uh, absolute performance metrics of models like accuracy recall or rmse or meep etc you can do that if you have uh, if you have ground a process to generate ground truth labels so i'll quickly show you how you can ingest them it's a fairly similar process uh, you just point dmm to where those ground truth labels are situated and again you will typically do this through apis and when you do it for the first time you say which is the ground truth column in that file which maps to a prediction say next and that's it so what it will do is it will now look at your ground truth labels it will look at the uh transaction id or the prediction id of each of the ground truth it will compare it with the uh, prediction made by your model which you had already ingested with the prediction data based on that comparison in case of classification models it will construct a confusion matrix for your model and calculate metrics such as accuracy precision recall f1 in this case they are set to do a weighted calculation now again you can dive into different time periods to uh, analyze for different uh, weeks different days different months and you can also set up schedule checks here as well and this is important because typically what we see is the ground truth labels come at a much slower frequency than let's say your predictions that the model is making so you may be running your data drift on a daily check but you may be running your model quality checks let's say once every two weeks or once every month right so this allows you to do that again uh, you can uh, check the history of it in the table so let me go back to that model where i where it has been running for few days and and you will again see on a particular day whether the model passed or model failed or which metric passed and failed you can and you don't have to come to dmm every time something fails you can actually set up who should be notified when a failure happens in this case i had set up myself and bob to receive the emails and when something fails you should receive an email something um, like this for this particular model which will say 
uh, that a, for a particular check, which are the features which failed, uh, by how much and what, how much was the training data, prediction data used for that particular check. So this way, you can always be on top of your model. You can always know how the patterns are changing as well as how the predictions of the model are changing. So how does this actually help you from a business perspective, right? Uh, first of all, monitoring model means trying to capture or keep an eye on the uncertainty associated with your ML models. Unlike a software applications, it is not that easy to say uh, when a model degrades, how much is going to be a financial impact. Uh, by using DMM, uh, you can proactively know when your model is going wrong so that you can take action beforehand. Uh, and it is in addition to sort of risk mitigating those situations, DMM also helps your data scientists focus their time on building new models, building new use cases, instead of uh, looking at, instead of spending time pulling data from different databases, writing checks, running checks, communicating with people, and uh, debugging on their own. And we have had customers, uh, in particular, one of our uh, early customers, Top Denmark, who have been using DMM and, and, afford, and they have seen a significant uh, saving in terms of time that was initially being spent on maintenance and investigation by their data scientist. So um, we caught a lot of information today. I uh, wanted to make sure you knew where you could go to get more information. So one of the things that you can do is go to our website. There's obviously a lot of information on there about Domino Model Monitor, as well as a blog that I published about a month ago. Um, all of you who attended today's webinar will also get a brand new white paper that we've created on best practices to establish monitor model monitoring within your company so it we'll, covers a lot of detail in terms of how to detect model decay what to do about it and again some best practices that you could establish within your own company but we'd also love you to give a give this a try and download a free trial of domino model monitor if you're an existing domino customer reach out to your customer success manager. They'll give you all the information that you need to get started with a free trial of DMM. If you're not a customer, you can go to our website and you see the link there. Um, don't worry, you don't have to scribble that down real quick uh, unless you want to sign up today. Uh, when you, we send out the follow-up information after uh, today's webinar, you'll get information on how you can sign up for a free trial of DMM. Okay, so as promised, we've got some time. We can take some questions here at the end. Sam and I know there's been a ton of questions that have been pouring and I'm trying to, to keep track of them all here. Um, why don't we start with one that I saw come in that said, um, and it's, it's, I've seen a couple of questions come in. So one of them was around, um, do we support uh, image classification models? And another person asked, do we have any solutions for detecting ground truth in non-time series data like image classification? So maybe we'll start with, you know, what types of models do we support here in DMM? Sure. Uh, so with DMM today, you can uh, detect drift, uh, input drift, and a model quality performance metric tracking for all structured data model, for classification model, for regression model, and also now for time series coming up. Uh, if you have unstructured data model, you can detect output prediction drift as well as monitor their performance metrics for the outputs of the models as well. We have some customers who use, who use sort of statistics of the unstructured data as input and use them to detect drift over that also to see, for example, how have text pattern changed based on some of the features that they have created around it, or how have images changed based on, again, features which they have derived based on the pixel values. Okay, cool, thank you. 
Uh, see another question that's come in. Uh, what platforms do we support model monitoring for? Is it unique to Domino? Why don't you go ahead and take that one? Yeah, so it is not unique to Domino. Uh, like I said earlier, you can monitor models irrespective of whether they are hosted in Domino or outside Domino. Uh, and, and the reason for that is, uh, like I said earlier, this is the reality of today's world that different teams use different technologies and different hosting environments. So you need that flexibility uh, to so that you have one tool where you get complete visibility of all models your organization is running. Perfect. Uh, let's see, you already answered the one about output drift without input drift or vice versa. So that one was good. Um, here, here's one, I'll go ahead and take this one. If I'm an existing Domino customer, do I get DMM for free? Um, this is a separate product from our core data science platform product that adds a lot of additional values, uh, or value to existing customers and it is licensed separately. So if you're an existing Domino customer, please reach out to, as I said, your customer success manager, give it a try, as well as your account executive for pricing for DMM. Um, let's see here. Uh, another one is good. Um, there is one question uh, I see on uh, how are numerical variables monitored and how is binning done for that? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so numerical variables are again monitored similar to categorical variables. In case of numerical variables, DMM will construct bins for them so that histograms can be calculated. Now there are various uh, attributes that you can declare to decide how those bins should be constructed. And for each features, you can potentially use a different binning strategy uh, that you want. Good. Um, looks like there was a number of questions around what data sources we can connect into DMM so that we can compare uh, to actually do the drift analysis. Um, I'm yep. paraphrasing because there's probably three questions that came in like that. Yeah, so, so let me answer a broader question, which is, uh, which I see there, which is, what if I have a data source which is not supported by DMM? Uh, how do I put data into it? Uh, so one is you can uh, move data to a data source which we support, or uh, additionally, uh, we can work with you to prioritize support for that particular data source if it is sort of important for you. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward process. Okay. Uh, I've got another question here. Um, it says, is there a limit to the number of models that DMM can support? Uh, not really. Uh, there is no inherent limit as to how many models you can support. Now, obviously, if you have a lot of models which have a lot of data, then the deployments need to be sized accordingly. So we, whenever we are deploying for any customer, we work with them to make sure that uh, the, uh, it, it can meet the requirements of the customer. Okay, cool. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. Let me just check the last questions that have come in and see if there's any new ones. Um, yeah, and I think we've pretty much covered uh, all we're going to cover. Uh, and I know we're at the top of the hour, so um, let's go ahead and, and wrap it up. But again, um, thank you all so much for being part of today's webinar. We really do appreciate it. As I mentioned, we would love for all of you to give DMM a try and you'll get all the information that you need to do that during the follow-up emails. Go ahead and check out the white paper that we sent you. And if you have any questions, by all means, please reach out to uh, your account executives to get information if you're a customer or come to our website, fill out a form, and we'll be glad to get back to you with any information that you want to have about DMM or any of our uh, offerings that we have here at Domino. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you for joining us and have a great day. We'll talk soon.